My name is Magneto. I am inevitable. I am Dark Side. Superheroes are very closely associated with gods, and it makes a lot of sense. They're both used as symbols for a lot of common traits and values. However, let's not forget that when it comes to power levels, supervillains are just as godly as any other deity out there. So today, we discuss the best moments when supervillains went god mode in the movies. how overpowered you have to be if it takes Batman, Wonder Woman and freaking Superman to take you down. Yeah, Doomsday ain't the kind of villain you'd take half chances against and he proves it in this scene literally with a blast. I mean, the guy just absorbs all the energy exploding in front of his face and goes thermonuclear mode as if he's Godzilla from King of the Monsters. Just look at him go, bro, so powerful. 911 calls him in case of an emergency. Well, he's technically a villain, but you, you get what I'm saying, don't you? The visuals perfectly capture the tone of the scene, and Zack Snyder deserves his flowers for matching the intensity of the situation with his direction. Man, the sheer magnitude of that power blast was so vicious that even a goddess like Wonder Woman needed her shield for protection. And if that isn't God mode, then I don't know what is. Living in the Gen Z era of TikTok and now Instagram threads, but personally speaking, 1994's The Mask is a film that everyone should watch. It perfectly captured the vibe of the 90s, while also giving us one of the many legendary performances by Jim Carrey. Of course, he's the heart and soul of the entire film, a spare a thought for Dorian, who actually turned out to be a pretty good villain. His intentions were believable, and more than anything else, he looked super threatening after putting on the mask. The one instance he showed off god-level vibes was when he absorbed all those bullets and spat them back out at Nico without a care in the world. Bro literally doubled it and gave it to the next person. But yeah, for a kid's movie, I'd say that's a pretty extreme scene to watch. This is gonna be fun. Five was such a simple time, wasn't it? For starters, we had a Reed Richards who actually knew how to use his brain. Sorry, I just love taking shots at John Krasinski's pasta version of the character. Anyway, this video ain't about the superheroes, so my focus here is Doctor Doom. He's easily an S tier villain, and it shows in the way he dominates the Fantastic Four. Now, if I were to choose my favorite moment involving him, it's got to be the final battle where he unleashes all those sparks and goes absolutely bonkers. Apart from blasting electricity through John. Johnny Storm, the man brushes aside the thing as if he's an actual pebble. Also, remember it took the Human Torch in supernova mode just to keep the guy in check. I know we already have a favourite God of Thunder, but Doctor Doom ain't too far off. A splendid character, but what a wasted opportunity. The Enchantress is a Superman level villain if you ask me, and yet here she is facing off against a bunch of people trying to get out of jail on a good behaviour card. Regardless, it doesn't take anything away from the fact that she's as powerful as they come in the DC Universe. I mean, not only is she the sister of Incubus, but also overshadows him in terms of their power level, so that's grade A badass. The scene where she summons that creepy looking storm easily takes the cake because it reveals the true potential of Enchantress. 
Be honest with me here. Doesn't this look like the freaking apocalypse is on us? I swear, they could have probably used the Enchantress as a Justice League villain if someone in the studio just used their brains for a microsecond. Unfortunately for Cara Delevingne, it's back to modelling for her. The competition against Thor just keeps on stacking up, doesn't it? I don't know where the jury's at on Jamie Foxx's Electro, but I really like the character because he looks like final boss material. I was glad they decided to bring him back in No Way Home because the dude deserved the extra praise. I mean, he's already trying to blast Spider-Man within the first few seconds of meeting him. Bro kept sending lightning bolts at Peter Parker as if he's never received an electricity bill his whole life. But on a serious note, I really like the way they made him look more terrifying because it complements his powers. The glow around him also gave a cool godly vibe to his appearance. He didn't need to shoot down so many trees, but I guess that's the price you gotta pay to prove a point. I speak for everyone when I say that Juggernaut is an absolute unit. The man's got no chill, and if the 2006 version of him was anything to go by, I'm sure a lot of us were expecting some sass in 2018's Deadpool sequel. That is, of course, apart from Wade Wilson himself. What we ended up getting was a truly terrifying opponent who managed to destroy an entire bridge simply by giving a whack to the truck carrying him. Just look at the damage he causes here. Bro really thinks he's one punch man. There's no denying the fact that Juggernaut has the strength of a god, so I'm really looking forward to the day we see a matchup between him and the Hulk. I'd bet my entire life savings just to see the both of them go at it. I guess you could call me a connoisseur of violence, eh? Mother. Mother, I crave violence. I'm gonna rip you in half now. <laughs> that is such a juggernaut thing to say. Oh, 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 Ah yes, Brandon strikes again in yet another unsettling scene that still haunts me at night. We all know the trope, don't we? She's just another dude whose entire existence is based upon giving an alternative perspective on Superman. It only makes sense for a guy like Brandon to be mentioned in a list like this, but damn. Bro has no chill, does he? Take the scene against the sheriffs as an example. There's no mercy shown whatsoever, and the effects actually add to the intensity of the scene. The stuff he does to those poor cops in front of Tori is simply inexcusable, but then again, <laughs> Who's gonna tell him? It's not like Clark Kent lives in this universe, so Brandon is the alpha force whom nobody can defeat. I've said it before, and I'm gonna say it again. All of this boils down to just one thing, and that's good parenting. <laughs> Imagine shooting a man with your last bullet, and he stands there! Unfazed. If you're going to deal with Sebastian Shaw, just know that he's a huge fan of karma. You get exactly what you give, but in this case it only includes violent acts. The CIA invasion kind of cemented the fact that Shaw is a somewhat unbeatable supervillain because they threw everything at him here and he just stood there looking completely unaffected. I can still understand with the grenade scene because weapons can be faulty sometimes, you know, but here he's taking the brunt of an entire army of soldiers and he gives them back their firepower with equally destructive force. I could also mention the tragic moment later with Darwin, but I think this one's good enough for now. There's absolutely no stopping this man when it comes to showdowns, so make sure you've got a telepath somewhere to ensure he stays in check.
Jonathan Majors might have had his fair share of controversies off screen, but I'm all about real life, so I'll just focus on Kang for now. To witness him attacking an entire civilization without any shred of humanity was, of course, a little bit too much to take in. However, he decided to do us one better and took on Scott Lang's entire Ant-Man family within a matter of seconds. It's not even like he was struggling or anything against them. I think it was just Scott who gave him a bit of a fight, but even then that was about as good as nothing. It was a ruthless display of power for sure, but you can't deny the fact that Kang's got the power level of a literal god. He is called the Conqueror for a reason, you know. The point between rage and serenity. Magneto has been one of the most consistent characters to date, and I don't just mean for the X-Men franchise. It's usually hard for someone to follow in the shoes of a legacy character because there's always the risk of fan backlash. I mean, just ask Ray about it, I'm sure she can relate. However, when Michael Fassbender took over the role of Eric from Sir Ian McKellen, he owned the screen and how. A lot of that had to do with his character's origin story, which is excellently captured in X-Men First Class. This was also the movie that gave us Magneto's first true god mode scene where he lifted a freaking submarine simply by listening to some friendly advice from Charles Xavier. I'll admit that the scene's directed well, but I've got to give huge props to the musical composition too. Those notes elevated me to a higher level of existence. See that? I believe that true focus lies somewhere between rage and serenity. If I were to ask you your honest opinion on the Mandarin in Iron Man 3, I'm sure you might say that it made the character look cheap just for the sake of a joke. And I've got to say in all honesty, it's the biggest piece of dog sh**. And I totally agree with that. And the MCU clearly listened to our complaints because the Mandarin we got in Shang-Chi was nothing short of legendary. For context, let me take you to one of those flashback scenes where he took down an entire army with the power of his rings. Apart from the general action choreography and obvious CGI, you can see the aura he was giving off and it totally suits villain material. Speaking of Shang-Chi, I know Simu Lu is busy with all those Barbie promotions right now, but bro should have just stuck around in the MCU because at least he's the main character there. Scott, you killed the man you love because you couldn't control your power. No, stop it! Now, here's a quick question. If you were up against a woman who has no idea about the destruction she's capable of, would you even think about challenging her? Well, Charles Xavier sure thought he could, and the poor man ended up paying the ultimate price for it. Well, that's not a technical point though, because bro just randomly revived himself looking exactly like he did before. Anyway, the reason this moment is being shown to you is because I'm a huge fan of this scene and what it signifies for the Phoenix. I mean, talk about being heartless. Jean Grey easily overpowers Charles and even disintegrates him with no chance of a rematch. It's bad enough that the man doesn't have any hair, but now he doesn't even have a body either. All right, I might have taken that a bit too far, but I don't care. No, don't shoot! No! It's no secret that Doc Ock is my favourite Raimi villain in the OG Spider-Man trilogy. 
Butterfingers. But let's be honest here, his only competition was the Green Goblin. No one's rooting for a skinny Venom, are they? Now there are a lot of moments where we get to see Otto Octavius show off his impressive strength, but that hospital scene really struck me. Not only is it the first time we get to see those robot arms in action, Sam Raimi's direction makes the whole thing feel so dramatic. It's almost as if we're witnessing the birth of something epic. Having said that, I've got to confess, it was a little funny to see Doc Ock getting so worked up inside a hospital room. Like, bro, isn't that supposed to be your place of work? Grant, you're a month late again. Again. I found a large roll of $20 bills in a rubber band. Ah, nice. It's not a gift. I use it for the good of mankind. If men were crackers, my daughter would be fat. <laughs> Don't try to sneak past me. I have ears like a cat. Nice. Like a rodent. It's not enough, young man. You have to work hard. You're lazy. Rage as deep as you can. You'll find you have the power to move the very earth itself. Traumas never a good thing, but you need to be able to deal with it if you want to live a happy life. Apocalypse is a good guy that way. He helped Magneto awaken his true potential by tapping him into the emotion that affected him the most. The only problem with that is he just wanted another overpowered sidekick by his side. Now, I won't get into that aspect of the film, but X-Men Apocalypse did give us some neat scenes with Magneto. The biggest highlight of them all has got to be the Auschwitz scene where Eric finally triggers his inner strength to be able to control rocks and concrete as well. Don't question the science. Apocalypse explained that already. However, if there was ever a moment where Magneto looked like a god, this is the one. The power on display is absolutely terrifying and the visuals serve as a great indicator of Eric reaching the pinnacle of mutant strength. God, it's yours. You can't defeat me. No, I know. But he can. Of all the villains in the MCU, I think Serta has the best redemption story. I mean, he got violated by Thor so bad that I thought he was better off dead. However, I was made to eat my words when Loki reawakened him as the last resort against Hela. Oh boy. I don't know about God mode, but bro definitely went demon mode here. His frame and design are already centered around a devilish vibe, but the strength he demonstrated was simply catastrophic. Like, he threw away the Hulk as if he was dealing with some random insect, and then he went on to destroy the whole of Asgard with just one finisher move. Even the goddess of death Hela couldn't do anything to him, and that's saying something. I mean, this is the same woman who broke Mjolnir for crying out loud. You saved us from extinction. Asgard is not a place. Asgard is where our people stand. Nothing will stop the return of the Sith! As much as the entire Star Wars franchise may like to hate on this movie, there is one scene that does deserve a mention in my top 10. Yep, it's the one where General Palpatine tosses away Kylo Ren like a used toy and proceeds to entertain the audience with his deadly force lightning strike. Darth Sidious was never an easy opponent, but the cinematography in this particular sequence made him look larger than life and the deafening silence during the lightning outburst seriously elevated the scene beyond anything else that we saw in that whole movie. Of course, there wasn't really much of a benchmark considering the fandom pretty much gave up on the franchise after this to be fair. Yet, I know a new Star Wars movie's been announced, but with the WAG strike in place, I just hope the studio execs rethink their strategies. I mean, all they gotta do is look at Indiana Jones 5's box office performance.
You know, I've never really seen a smile on Eric's face whenever he's Magneto. Well, not at least the Michael Fassbender version anyway. Obviously, he doesn't have much to smile about, but at the same time, Bro needs to up the sass factor if he wants to live up to Sir Ian McKellen's legacy. This scene in Days of Future Past does some justice to that notion because it's a total flex and it's most definitely something that a god would do. Do you even know how heavy a stadium is? These things cost around $200 million just for construction. Eric doesn't care about the economics though, so he airlifts the entire stadium just so that he can make a statement in front of the humans trying to end his race. He does have a point though, doesn't he? But doing the same thing with humans as the victims isn't helping his case now, is it? Today was meant to be a display of your power. Instead, I give you a glimpse of the devastation my race can unleash upon yours. Thanos has always been the big bad wolf throughout the Infinity Saga, so it makes sense to overpower him to such ridiculous extremes as can be seen here. Just think about it. Here are the Avengers he takes down collectively in just a couple of minutes. First there's Bruce Banner in the Hulkbuster armor, then there's Black Panther, Falcon, the Dora Milaje, the Winter Soldier, War Machine, Black Widow and Captain America. Yeah, I know most of these people aren't exactly A-grade fighters, but even then, it is pretty impressive. Bro unlocked all his cheat codes at the same time. Oh yeah, and let's not forget that Thanos also fends off Wanda's magic and turns back time to humiliate Vision yet again. It truly makes you look at the Mad Titan as if he's an indestructible deity. I finally rest and watch the sunrise on a grateful universe. The hardest choices require the strongest wills. I know you might like to make fun of Voldemort and his spells on social media, don't you? There's no point trying to hide it, I've seen the videos. Having said that, the core villain of the Harry Potter franchise is a force to be reckoned with and he's shown it time and time again. Probably the most memorable one of all is when he destroys the entire Hogwarts shield in three business seconds. The screech sounds a little bit excessive if you ask me. <coughs> but the rest of the scene lands perfectly as it captures fear, admiration and terror all at the same time. No wonder the man has such a huge cult following, maybe Tedros could learn a thing or two from him. Just give that karate a rest bro, you ain't hurting anyone with those moves. Jean Grey using her phoenix powers is pretty much the same as Thanos using the Infinity Stones. You just can't win against them. Dark Phoenix isn't a movie that I go back to, but some of its scenes particularly stand out, which is why I keep listing them on my videos. In this case, we're looking at the moment where Jean breaks free from her shackles and unleashes a burst of energy that not only brushes aside Vuk, but also destroys the entire train in the process. Keep in mind that she's also protecting her beloved X-Men buddies in telepathic shields whilst this is all happening. Oh yeah, and there's also the part where she assassinates all those other weirdo aliens as well. Yeah, that's a goddess right there if you ask me. Let me show you how. I'm disappointed in you, Adrian. I'm very disappointed. You know what, we should just put Dr. Manhattan up against Superman for a live action matchup and see what happens. Nobody talks about this guy, and it's a real shame considering how overpowered he is for his own liking. There are tons of scenes throughout 2009's Watchmen that prove my point, but I don't want to focus on anything too flashy. The reason is because Dr. Manhattan functions on an extreme level of perpetual philosophy and his encounter against Ozymandias perfectly showcases it. Reassembling myself was the first trick I learned. It didn't kill Osterman. 
Did you really think it would kill me? Of course, there's also the part where he's a gigantic figure, almost like God judging you for your sins. But yeah, it's the dialogue that grants him an entry into my top five. You might be wondering why I was only covering Fastbender's Magneto all this time when I prefer the OG version. Well, here he is in all his glory and that too in a scene that surpasses anything that the younger Eric has ever accomplished. Yeah, some will argue that a stadium is a pretty big deal, but just think about it. Magneto's lifting a whole bridge during his senior years and transporting it to another location with his entire team on it. Now, it takes a lot of power to get that done. And Sir Ian McKellen's performance is completely relentless for the entire duration of the scene. Jean Grey might have been the focus of the movie, but you should never take your eyes off the core villain. That remarkable metal doesn't run through your entire body, does it? Kneel before me and rise into the ranks of my great conquest. Fine. Defeating an army is one thing, but taking down a whole legion to lay claim to a freaking planet is a whole other ball game. Hell is a deserving supervillain for many reasons. And no, it's not just because I'm a huge simp for evil women. Yep, I know Serta easily humbled her back in entry number 11, but this sequence is a lot more detailed and impactful. Hella manages to defeat army after army with minimal effort, which just goes on to show why she's such a deadly opponent in combat. Like, how many weapons can a person summon even if they're a literal god? It kind of makes me wonder if she was the type of sister who'd bully her younger brothers as a child, especially Loki, because, well... He's adopted. I understood that reference. Of all the messy Star Wars sequels we've been punished with over the last decade, Rogue One stands out as a shining light amongst all of them. Sure, it isn't a perfect work of art or anything like that, but it manages to make us care for its characters and even keep us invested in the story. Oh yeah, and it's also got Darth Vader going savage mode in a scene that always finds itself in my favour. The Rampage sequence is as deadly as you're ever going to see the man, and with each passing second, he just gets angrier and angrier. This is a legacy character who commands respect, and I'm so glad the writers actually portrayed him the correct way over here. <laughs> Be careful not to choke on your aspirations, Director. <laughs> We all know how powerful Thanos is as a character, but to see him in action and prove his worth does put a smile on my face. I don't want to spend too much time focusing on how he defeats the Guardians of the Galaxy or Spider-Man because those were easy wins for him. Doctor Strange was surely a worthy opponent, but even he was tossed aside like an old sweater. The real moment of superiority is when he throws a whole goddamn moon at Iron Man, decimates his most powerful suit till date, and then even stabs Tony Stark with his own tech. Yeah. That's how a ruthless god operates. Make no mistake, Thanos is the best possible example of one. It always will be. I am inevitable. Hope you liked the video, so please subscribe to the TV region, and here's another video that I know you'll enjoy. One.